Welcome to the February Next Practice event, which is the flagship series of events hosted by the Imperial Enterprise uh, Lab. For those who don't know me, my name is Ileana Stigliani, and I work as a system professor uh, in the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Department, and I will be the chair and, uh, and the hostess of this event uh, tonight which is dedicated to the uh, role of service design in disrupting the service economy. And I have to say that I'm quite excited to have this role tonight because if, I have if you have looked at our website and also uh, read through the leaflet that uh, we have distributed, you might have realized that we have put together an amazing and awesome panel, a, a very good set of presenters, uh, now, we are going to go uh, uh, with a different order in the presentations because the, the, the good thing about being the chair of the event is that I can make my own rules. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to go for ladies first. So we will have Niharika Hariharan first, then we will have Marta Oliveira, then Ravi Chatpar, Chris Downs, and last but not least, Edmund Haar. Just a couple of words about our presenters. So we will have Niharika, who is a service designer and also now design um, director at McKinsey and Company. We have Marta Oliveira, who is a senior service designer at uh, Engine Service Design. Ravi Chatpar, who is founder of the Design Impact Group and partner at Dahlberg. Uh, and then we have Chris Downs one of the fathers of service design, co-founder of LiveWork, and now founder and managing director of Normally. And we have Edmund Hoar, who is a, an uh, imperial alumnus and also the founder of Trayport, a software a company. I'm, I'm sure you will tell more about it. So just to give you a couple of words about the format of the event, so each presenter will talk for 10 minutes and provide their own point of view about the role of service design and the, how, how service design can disrupt the service economy. And then at the very end, we will have a Q&A session with all the uh, panelists sitting down there that I will moderate. So if you have questions, please hold on tight to them for the final Q&A. And then after the Q&A, we will have a networking session over drinks and nibbles. So I'm sure it will be a very, very interesting and exciting event, and I will leave the floor to Niharika. Well, thank you. Great. Thanks for coming, everyone, and thanks to Ileana, Chris, Nina, and everyone else who's organized this wonderful event. So. Um, my name is Neharika. I'm a design director at McKinsey Digital Labs in London. I'm going to jump straight into the topic, which is actually a very big, heavy one. Ooh. Yeah. Disrupting the service economy and the role of service design. And that got me thinking, what really disrupts the service economy? What, what, what are the trends? What are the things that impact the way we live? the services we invent, the services we want to use, and things like war, politics, referendum, those are the things that come to mind. Now, those are things that truly change the way economy works. And I'll leave you with a question, but not an answer necessarily, to have a think about what role does service design play in those true disruptors. Right, so. Let's go to the second tier of disruptors. And there are possibly more, but here are three. Digital transformation, new business models, new services and products. I think the usual suspects, Kickstarter, peer-to-peer -peer lending, Google Maps, your usual Airbnb and Ubers of the world. Uh, so those are the kind of areas that, that those are the kind of trends, factors, models that are changing the way service economy is shaped and how we engage with it. Now, my question to you again is, can all of these things be done well without service design? Can there be a successful new product or a service launched without service design? Can there be a digital transformation done successfully without the use of service design? Possibly. So what, does, what role does service design play in all of this? I don't think there is one right answer to this question, but perhaps one way of looking at it is that service design 
is a wrapper, is a facilitator that makes sure that everything, all the different elements and aspects of a service are facilitated well. They're relevant and they add value to each and every agent or aspect of that service, whether it's people, technology, or business. Now, just because it's a facilitator, does that warrant it enough to be a disruptor? Again, it's a question for everyone to think about. So, my, I think there's plenty of information and conversations that we have within the community that talk about the great work that we're doing within service design. And I think all of that is relevant and valuable. But what I'd like to really think about and, and talk about here is, is about the limitations or the opportunities to really shape service design as a practice even further to become something that truly impacts the way we experience service economy, the way we shape it, and the way we disrupt it and sustain that disruption. And there are very various ways of doing it, but for the purpose of this, I'd like to share just two with you. The so first one is bringing thinking and making together. Now, design thinking has done wonders in many ways to our, to our practice because it, it's packaged design in a way that we can all understand whether you've been educated in it or not. It also positioned us away from we make things look pretty to, to a strategic tool that helps us solve problems, that helps us engage with organizations and people in a very different way. However, maybe there is a bit of balance that's been lost where we don't talk about the craft of making. And I think what often happens is we sell design in different packages. We sell service design, then there's business design, there's experience design, there's customer experience design, and anyone who's walked into a big organization, whether it's a bank or a telco, would know that we are creating, that sol problem, solving problems in silos does not work. And my question to you again is, are we creating too many silos within design, and is service design another one of those? And what does that mean in terms of the measurable impact and value service design creates in comparison to what business design does or what customer experience design does? So I think in order to truly create value, we need to do one, or two, one of two things. One is to stop looking at design and silos and really bring together thinking and making so that we can really understand how to shape something and push that into how it's crafted, but also not forget the fact that a lot of thinking happens when you're crafting and get, that gets pushed back into thinking. So we can't work in these two different ways. And if you take a typical project, um, let's take an example of a digital project in a design consultancy. It's broken down into roughly three areas. You start off by doing service design, which includes research. You come up with recommendations, you do your blueprints, and then that gets pushed into experience design, or you could call it UI or UX or whatever, and that gets pushed into the making. Those two things need to work together, but because we break things in the way we sell them, we also break problem solving in different silos. So that's one, either we look at design as a whole and really hone in the value of service thinking across all disciplines of design, or we differentiate it from all the other disciplines and say service design is different because it's truly here to disrupt the service economy, it's truly here to change the way we experience services. But for that, we would need a different method. Now, while service design has added a lot of value in the way we communicate our practice, the way we and I think blueprints and ecosystems are a tool that really come out of that discipline as well. A large part of the way we do service design is fundamentally the way we do design, whether it's industrial product or service. And I think if, if, the, if we decide that service design needs to really be disruptive and true to the service economy, it warrants a different process and a different set of tools. So that's one, which is really bringing thinking and making together and leveraging service design as something that is more than a facilitator. And the second thing I want to talk about is making service design actionable. And this is one of the key things that, that we all as a practice, we need to start doing because if you can't make things actionable, you don't understand the value of them. And if, if they don't, they're not actionable, then there's no real disruption. A large part of the service design work that we do within consultancies sits in the concept development phase, which means it doesn't get implemented. So in theory, we're not really producing anything. There was a report uh, on design service innovation that said that about the minimum percentage of time and effort spent by service design, uh, service designers on service design projects is writing service specifications. And the maximum amount of assets produced by service designers are used in presentations, over 80, 81%, I think. 
So you can see the comparison. So about 30% is spent on writing specifications, which is actually the action, and over 80% is on presentations. So my point is that we need to be more critical of how we, how we, what we deliver. If you look at the blueprint, a typical template, and I'm sure whoever does do service design adapts the template to their own needs and necessities, but a typical template has things like what are the needs, what are the customer steps, what are the pain points, what are the opportunities. It's a lot of information. It's insight giving information. But how that translates into a real experience to actually disrupt something, uh, there's, there's a lot lost in translation there. So I think we need to learn from other methods like Agile, which not, I'm not talking about the delivery of Agile, but more about how they really hone in on the fact that you have to create things that are actionable that people can go off and build and make. And we need to start becoming, taking on the role of producing almost service specifications or service backlogs, for the lack of a better word, that are actionable. So we create an overview of what we want to do, what that experience looks like, but we also need to be able to write a specification and backlogs that make things actionable and measurable. And the last point I want to leave you with, and I'm not quite sure if, if I've got my thoughts on this, but I'll share this with you anyway, is to focus on invention. Um, there are organizations and consultancies and service designers who are really put, looking to push the boat out, but as largely as a practice, we sit within the very operational level where you have a banking app that's not really doing well, let's improve it. You have a sales, ex sales process that's not quite customer-centric, let's use service design to improve it. And as long as we sit within the operational layer of improving, we're not going to be able to disrupt the economy. So we need to start having a conversation at a point where we're thinking more in terms of new, new ventures. And a lot of management consultancies are already moving in that direction where everything that they do, they're pushing, pushing that into how can we set up a new venture out of this? How can we set, set, help you set up a new business? And I think in order to truly disrupt the service economy, we need to start evolving our service design process and our tools to really naturally land on that space where we're talking about new business and new ventures. So to conclude, I think the real impact of service design um, is that we need to look inward at the discipline. So we are looking outward, we're talking about it, we're educating the world about it, and that's great, and that has a lot of value, and we should continue to do that. But also I think we need to look more critically at what we do and how can we evolve our process and how can we really do that in a way that we can truly be a force to be reckoned with when we create disruption within the service economy and we can sustain that. And how do we do that so there's measured value? Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Yes. yes? Great. So hi, I'm Martha. I'm from Engine Service Design. I'm a senior service designer there, and I'll be building on what Niharika has already been talking about, and talking about how organizations can make the shift from the world of today to the world of tomorrow. And um, Thinking around you know, the rapid changes that are going on in the service industry, at Engine, one of the ways that we look at these changes is that we've been going from a world of craft bespoke products to mass bespoke services. And what this means is that we started off in a world where we were in a world of craft products. We bought our clothes from our tailors, our furniture was done at a carpenter, and as enter the industrial revolution, enter line production, enter electricity, we move into a world of mass production, where we get products in mass, mass clothing, mass cars, the standardized production of cars, et cetera. And um, as technology begins to evolve again, we move into a time of mass services. Now, internet and contact centers enable companies to be able to reach even more customers than they did before. And as technology becomes even more sophisticated, today we're in a world of mass bespoke services. Technology enables us to be able to design for the context of customers. So we have personalized services that are delivered. We have big, big banks in the brink of imp implementing robo-advisors, so everybody can have access to customized financial advice. Airbnb is democratizing the access to unique, authentic accommodation experiences or travel experiences now as they expand. And with Uber, we can have a personalized driver at the tip of our fingers. Anybody can have that. But there is more to tomorrow's customer than 
the fact that they want a personalized service. And even though customers are changing year on year, we've realized that base needs stay roughly the same. So let me elaborate. The customer of 10 years ago found transparency just as important as a customer of today. How that shapes up is completely different. 10 years ago, a customer would have been perfectly happy if they wouldn't know that their parcel is being delivered in five days. Today, you need to know exactly where the parcel is, exactly who has it, exactly how long is it until it comes. Overload of information. And, and, and the customer of tomorrow will still value transparency. But again, the way that, that the, the, the customer will, will expect that need to be fulfilled, that is where the difference is going to vary. And um, so how can companies respond to such a changing market all the time. Customers are changing, new technologies are coming in. How, what kind of service models should they have in place to be able to respond to these changes? We've thought about this, and what, what, what we came across is that it's not so much as to what service models you adapt or, and you implement, but how you reach these service models. We thought, and at Engine, we, we feel that it's about having design-led change and implementing design-led change in organizations rather than adopting a specific service model. And for us, what this means is that companies need to be vision-led and customer-inspired. We've, we've identified seven core capabilities that organizations can have and can develop in order to be able to respond and shift better to market changes. I'll run you through them very fast. So first one is to have compelling visions. The next one is to create beautiful design. After that, it's about creating clear cases, about creating design that is ready to build, about fostering the right conditions, managing engaging projects, and communicating effectively with well-realized well outputs. I'm going to talk about two of these, which work in and the opposite end of the same spectrum. The first one is about being, having convision, compelling vision. And the next one is about being ready to build. So I'll be talking about some similar topics that Niharika has brought up as well. So we'll be building on it from a bit of a different perspective. So when you, are, when you have a compelling vision, what this means is that the organization has a unified, central thought about how it wants to serve its customers. Everybody understands how it is. It's simple, it's inspiring, it's motivating, and it's grass a company and everybody can get behind this. The reason why this is important for in order to be able to respond to changes in the market is that if everybody in the organization understands where they're going, that will make sure that you're directing your resources and your change efforts. And at the same time, it taps into transformational levels of investment in an organization. This means that you are no longer asking for budget to make an incremental change in a process and in a part of an experience, but you're, you're asking for money to be able to realize the organization's dream. And that makes a bit, makes a lot of, is very powerful and makes a difference. And having a good vision is not the only thing that you need. You also need to have design that can be implemented. Because a lot can happen between the moment that a vision is signed off and the moment that it goes into market. So that's why designing experiences that are ready to build is very important. And what this means is that you think design through you take into account the capabilities of the organization, current and future. You preempt implementation risks, and you make sure there's consensus for the implementation of design and experiences and concepts. And you create a capability where implementing concepts is part of the normal reality. One such company that has realized the power of these seven capabilities is Dubai Airports. Engine have been working with Dubai Airport since 2014 now. They came up to us because they didn't know um, where they wanted to go. They were a big company focused on building, competing on size, and they realized that that was not going to keep them competitive in the future. So we work with them and we help them design a vision for them that we, that we then shared with the, the whole organization. Everybody was really excited, super inspired, and then they thought, now what? This is great. Arabian hospitality and meaningful connections, and we've got a couple journey maps to sound great, and like our personas, this is, this is wonderful. What does this mean? So then we work with them to start taking that vision down and work so it becomes ready to build, and helping them 
alongside developing the capabilities to make design ready to build when it's founded in a vision, creating the clear cases, motivating engaging projects, etc. One of the first steps we did was implement information provision changes for customers or their passengers. We took a very small part of the airport to do a proof of concept where we changed the signage around, we changed the added some information points, we added some airport guides, etc., all based on what the vision was taking the vision down and trickling it down to an actionable part of an experience. We're able to drive results in regards to operations, it was easier to run the airport, customers were happier, and it also drove financial results for the organization, which is great. We also work with frontline staff. What does that vision mean for staff behaviors? We work with, we train 300 people up to now, scaling up to 1,500 at the moment, and we've been able to also have results in the way that frontline staff interpret that vision and understand what it means their day to day. And then this has all been supported by, by, by um, new ways of working. So it's not just engine working these individual projects. We're shaping the way that the department speaks. They had never both con conceived an idea and implemented it. That capability did not exist. We're helping them shape that helping them speak between departments and find ways that are sustainable for their context, that work in their context. So wrapping up then, what's really important in all of this is that it's not so much what new service models are adopted to react and to shift in the, market, in the world of today, but it's really more about how it is that you get to these service models. That's it. Thank you. gentlemen. <laughs> thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thanks for having me here today. i um, really excited to share some thoughts on this very big topic um, about how we think about service design as a way to disrupt the, the service economy. Um, by way of background, I'm going to perhaps give you a bit of a different perspective on how to think about this problem. You know, I spent the early part of my career working at, in a number of product and technology and design roles at startups and in the private sector before landing at a, a large design agency called Frog Design, where I spent 10 years, uh, and then left three years ago to start a, uh, a new design practice focused on primarily the, uh, focused on serving uh, the emerging markets, uh, focused on social impact topics, and essentially uh, built around uh, an integrated model of design where we can use the power of design and all of its flavors, human-centered design, service design, product design, design thinking, um, but use it in conjunction with strategy, with business planning, with partnerships, with financing, with many of these other ingredients that particularly when you're thinking about topics like education or public health uh, or financial inclusion uh, in many developing countries, uh, you have to, you know, you need more than just design. Design needs to almost be so perfectly situated that at times it's artificial to hope that design on its own will be able to solve some of these challenges. Uh, so this, this group is called DIG, Design Impact Group. Um, we have four studios right now um, across the world embedded across uh, 15, 15 uh, offices of our parent company, Dahlberg. Now, the thing about design thinking that is, uh, that I think is quite powerful for this context, although it evolved um, out of the private sector, often in places where there are highly competitive and developed markets, right, like consumer electronics or financial services, in these underserved sectors, we find that the same principles are still very valuable. Right? We're talking about people who, for whom we often have very little information, very little understanding of how they think, how they work, what they, what they want, what they need, very few precedents to draw on in terms, in terms of products and services and solutions that may help them. And so the principles of design work very well in theory. Um, now, interesting, so five years ago, I was in Rwanda. I met this woman, Hillary, uh, in a rural village, and I was doing work on behalf of Visa, right, the credit card company, and they were thinking, we want to create something highly disruptive and innovative, the equivalent of bringing in a credit card right, into a country that does not have credit cards. Right? Uh, that's what they were hoping for. Uh, and so we met this woman, and she runs an SLA, a savings and loans group, which is a way for villagers to essentially put in a little, mo little money every month, and then that money is pooled and can be used to purchase something. Uh, now, what was interesting about this is her goal was to, f to have all of her members save up to buy a grass mattress. 
And the reason for that is no one had beds or any sort of mattresses in their homes. And a grass mattress actually was a way to force their husbands to come home because there was an infidelity problem in the village. Right? And so, and they were all, you know, husbands were going, you know, gallivanting off in the neighboring kind of communities. And so, when you think about that, that is incredibly innovative, right? She's essentially invented a savings product, like a bank may offer, right? To bring a whole community together to target this cultural, you know, social issue of infidelity. And when we told the story to Visa, they almost just gave up. They said, how can we possibly be innovative in this environment when you're surrounded by this type of thinking? Could any of us imagine a bank in the West or in London or anywhere is coming up with something like that, a product that is tackling some deeply entrenched domestic issue, right? And that's really the world that we're trying to step into. So how do you think about disruption in this context, right? That was a question we were looking at. And it may be natural to start from the perspective of, well, this woman is, ex is extremely poor, making a few dollars per month. So how can we raise her income? She's a farmer, right? And that's probably a good place to start. How can you drive, how could you increase her agricultural income? Farming is tough, right? You get your, your, your income comes maybe once or twice a year when your crops are sold, and then you have to stretch it out through the course of the year. If you start unpacking her life, you start seeing it's quite complex. That, that SLA that I told you about is what's called a ROSCA right at the top. That is just one example of the many formal and informal networks and organizations that surround her just in the context of farming. She has a cooperative. She has to deal with storage facilities, with agro dealers, with input providers, with all of this complexity. If any of you worked in agriculture, you know it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty hectic. Right? But as you start probing here, you can see there are many ways that we could think about design as a way to bring in solutions that could improve her life. And some of the things that we've worked on over the years are, you know, how about a way just using a simple gamification with some badges, helping her uh, create a layaway program so you could pay a little bit and purchase a packet of seeds and fertilizer to help you at, at a better price. Or think about mobile. Mobile would seem like an obvious way to reach some of these people. Um, you could come up with microloans. We've been working with banks to offer $5, $10 instant loans um, on your phone that could be paid back. Right? And so you could think of many of these types of solutions that could have quite an impact. And, and indeed, there are many organizations uh, who, are, uh, who are really engaged in, in, uh, in coming up with these ideas. But now what's interesting is you know, there's a real chicken and the egg problem here with these types of uh, financial inclusion solutions. Think about the idea of if you wanted to bring a credit card system to London and credit cards did, didn't exist. You face this challenge of how do you get all of you in the room to start using them if merchants won't accept them? And how, how do you get merchants to start accepting them if nobody wants to use them? Right? And this happens all the time whenever you're bringing in new financial technologies. Uh, and this happened a lot when we start uh, thinking about um, bringing in mobile technologies to help her. Uh, and so as we start unpacking this problem a little bit more, you realize the real ecosystem we need to be thinking about is actually not her life. It's really where the, where the money is happening, where the flows of, of information, flows of products, where the flows of money are happening, are really around this network of merchants and agents that, inter that interact around her. And when you have, in these contexts, limited resources, we often don't have the resources of the private sector where we can put a lot of money into working with 10 different organizations at once. It's really about where do you prioritize to achieve your maximum impact. And in this case, you may actually have to make what's often a very difficult decision not to focus on those ideas for Hillary, but let's focus on the ideas that are going to empower some of these agents and networks around her because that's what's going to create a catalytic effect in the market and drive greater use of these technologies. And so, again, you can come up with a whole variety of very simple and often low-tech solutions ranging from leaderboards from, for, for agents to encourage them to compete with one another uh, to, uh, to tools to help them interact a bit more, uh, to, to, to help them sell products more effectively uh, to, uh, to their customers because they don't really have the, the right communication tools. Simple mobile services as well are a part of it. Now let's say you do all of this and Hillary's SLA actually works, right? Um, but the context then changes. She's able to get her husband home, right? And then nine months later, she's pregnant. Okay? Now all of a sudden, when someone is just making $5 you know, a month, there are a completely different set of priorities that come into play. Right? And you wonder, some of these ideas that we've come up with to help her purchase inputs, uh, will they actually make a difference? And instead, do we need to focus on more fundamental issues? From her perspective, the most important way in which you can guarantee income for yourself is to have a child. Because that child is going to potentially be a laborer uh, and potentially will have a better life if they're able to go to school and become educated and move on somewhere. And so all of a sudden, her priorities shift 
from thinking about farming to thinking about raising a child. Uh, and now, unfortunately, we're in a, in a world where 30% of, of uh, uh, there's a high, high rate of, uh, of maternal death, uh, sorry, of, of, of childhood death um, within the first three months after childbirth. Um, part of what we explored here is how could a very simple solution, chlorhexidine, right, which is a, an antiseptic, which is used, uh, applied to the umbilical cord immediately after birth. It's been proven to reduce infant mortality. It's you know, sanctioned by the World Health Organization. It has pretty significant impact. Um, but in fact, it's very, very hard uh, to get people to start using it. And similarly, as we start unpacking her ecosystem, now from a mother's perspective, you realize she's got many entrenched cultural beliefs that dictate why you won't use a chemical uh, right after childbirth. You have a network of community health workers who are volunteers you know, in the community who don't really know uh, about modern practices. You have chemists uh, who also have inconsistent knowledge of all of these things. And you have an ecosystem, none of which, ha none, none of, uh, uh, where no single individual entity or person has the ability to influence change. We could come up with, if we had un unlimited resources, many examples of some of those designed solutions that I showed you before uh, to kind of tackle this whole ecosystem, but in real life, that's not realistic given the resources that we have. And so we have to take an approach that's more about empowering the ecosystem with tools, right? Let's create a toolkit that could include messaging on how, uh, that me me messaging on how, uh, on, on why you should approach uh, umbilical, umbilical cord treatment this way. Use visual storytelling, use brand identifiers, uh, use other kits that come in a box, right? Use a whole series of products, services, messaging, campaign, awareness ideas that can be implemented in different ways by a chemist versus, uh, you know, a local community health worker versus a government agency or a hospital. And in fact, providing just a kit of tools with the hope that some people will use it right, some people will use it imperfectly, some people will get it completely wrong, but collectively across the system, that's a way to drive incremental behavioral change. All right, so all of this is a way to, a way to say that you know, for, for problems like this, um, the problems do seem so complicated, so entrenched into often what seem like multiple intersecting and competing ecosystems of, of players, of influencers, of governments, of, of providers. Uh, but these simple solutions that we can bring to life through a design process are quite powerful. But it's not just the simplicity of the solutions. It's about orchestrating them, connecting them in a way that supports the, way, uh, supports the diverse needs of these people and the fact that these needs change so fundamentally uh, over the course of, uh, you know, over the course of day-to-day -day living. Thank you. take a risk. <clears throat> oh, magic technology. Um, okay, thanks everyone. I'm Chris, and I work with this group of people. This is normally in Shoreditch, and we are a team of digital product and service designers. But I'm not going to talk about that group of people. I'm going to start with this group of people. This is not the people I work with. This is the Bauhaus. And so I'm going to start my talk with a design history lecture. It's got nothing to do with Ileana's question. It's just something, uh, it's a passion of mine, and so I'm going to indulge myself in 10 minutes talking about design history. Uh, these people uh, are the Bauhaus, an incredibly influential group of people that came together in the 1930s, uh, designers, artists, engineers, whose mission was to democratize the technology of the day. They wanted to use technology for the good of people. And the technology of their day was the production line and was mass production. And one of the greatest icons that came out of this thinking is the Volkswagen Beetle. And the, when tied to the, the ideology of the Bauhaus, their thinking was that we could use mass production to make artifacts easily replicable. We could make many tens of thousands of units of the same thing that can be sold to people easily, that these things ought to be practical, products should be practical, they should have use. The brief, the original brief set by Adolf Hitler uh, for, to Ferdinand Porsche was that this vehicle had to carry a family of three at 60 kilometers an hour 
at an average fuel consumption of 33 miles per gallon. It's an, an, imman, an incredibly practical design brief, um, but it also had to be designed to be affordable. These three attributes that the Bauhaus instilled in the way that we thought about making products led to this incredible opportunity for ownership. So before we start to think about how service design can fuel the service economy, we have to go back here and think about how product design fueled the product economy. And what happened as a consequence of that? Well, we end up in this situation. This thing is not really practical. This thing is not about physical, physical mobility and social mobility. This thing is about, oh, this, it's got to be the most disgusting designed object on the planet because it references something that had real meaning and real social impact and it's just become a fashion item and a style icon and something that's there purely for self-expressive value. It's not that, I, I trained as a product designer originally and this isn't just me feeling bitter about the fact that all the great products had already been designed before my career could start. Uh, but what happened with, with this situation, with the product dominant logic, is that we ended up, production became cons consumption. We ended up becoming mass consumers. And we all know where, how that story ends, as this becomes award-winning landfill. Um, but this isn't actually a picture of a car. This is a picture of the internet. Um, I love the internet. It's designed originally to link documents together so that we could find documents, we could read documents, we could access documents, and we could share documents. What a brilliant idea. But a few idiots decided that maybe documents weren't enough. What if we could use the same network technology that underpinned this document-based internet and start linking objects together? Um, so for me, what, fuel, what really has fueled the service economy is the internet. And uh, if we take service design as uh, something that's evolved from product design, we take the same principles about using design to have social impact, to make social good for social mobility, and, then, and we use the technology of the day to democratize it, and we're talking about democratizing the internet and the way the internet can change the way we consume products. So now as designers, we have to think about making, using the internet to make th these things visible, so I need to be able to know it exists. I need to know that it's available. I need to know that not someone else is using it already. And I need it to be accessible. I need to be able to open the door, get in, and use it. So now we're designing not for ownership. Now we're designing for access. That's the design history lecture over. Um, so what is service design? Now I'm going to talk about I've got five minutes left to actually do my talk. That wasn't my talk. That was a preamble. Now I've got 10 minutes, right? Uh, no. So what is service design? I've got a. Uh, a definition. Service design is not very high in the list of people think the things that people think they need. Um, and I've got a really sad story about a design project that's been happening in the studio recently. We were commissioned by Nokia, the mobile phone manufacturer. They gave us one of these and a brief. Could we design the user interface for a device intended to help Clinicians monitor angioplasty patients after discharge from hospital. So this is a prototype device that is um, a medical grade monitoring device that monitors respiratory rates, uh, O2 levels in the blood, heart rate, blood pressure. Amazing, even better than a Fitbit, um, but a little bit clumsy. Nokia were like, I think we can do better than this. We can make it a bit smaller and a bit smarter. But what we want is we want to put these on angioplasty um, patients, so people that have had pretty major but routine heart surgery and have to stay in hospital being monitored for a week after the, after the um, operation. Nokia like, if we give them this, uh, a new version of this, a much smaller one that looks like an, I, an iPad probably, uh, if we can give them a much smaller version of this, we can send them home early, saving millions of pounds, and all the clinician has to do is sit at his desk and monitoring a big dashboard of screens to see how his patients are doing. Sounded like a brilliant idea, and what Nokia wanted us to do is design this. Can you design an iPad app for the clinician who can monitor his patients while they're at home? So, the first thing we did as service designers is, because service design is founded on the principles of human-centered design, we had to meet the humans behind, behind the, the potential service. So we met with these fine clinicians, and the first thing they told us was, the brief is completely bollocks, because... Uh, 
The problem isn't with monitoring. The problem isn't with bed space. The problem is if there is something wrong that's monitored within a week, they have 20 seconds to respond. So if we sent these people home early with a remote monitoring device and, and something flashed up on my dashboard, on my iPad, to say, this guy's going into cardiac arrest, there's nothing I can do about it. So, so they're solving the wrong problem. So the first thing service, can do to help, service design can do to help fuel the service economy is ask the right questions and challenge briefs. Um, so what, the, what these clinicians told us was, uh, we're solving the wrong problem, but there is a much better problem that could be solved with monitoring devices, and that is to remove the need for outpatients. Outpatients are those useless human beings that need to come in regularly for, uh, for tests, to be weighed, to be measured, to have the heart rate taken, and heart measurements taken. So the clinician said, if you could get rid of those people for us, that's a problem worth solving. And so we asked them a bit more about what, it, what that would mean. They said, well, we've got two real problems with outpatients. Number one is that uh, we need to collect data from them, and they keep coming into hospital to give us the data about their weights and their measurements. Um, and the other problem is we give them care plans, and they don't adhere to them. So we're like, OK, show us these care plans. What are these care plans that you're having problem with pe people adhering to? And they couldn't show us one. They didn't exist. Care plans are mental models of how patients um, Health is organized that only the clinician knows in their heads, and the poor patient never knows what it is they're doing. So no wonder they don't turn up to the right, uh, to the right appointment. No wonder they forget to take their medication. No wonder they forget to weigh themselves at 9 o'clock every morning and not 11 o'clock every morning, because it's never written down, it's never documented, and they can't follow it. The best copy of a care plan that we found was this. It's on someone's kitchen wall. These letters are organized sequentially, and they've got a calendar showing them exactly what they need to do when. So we found this mythical beast, which was a care plan, and we, we wanted to build, we needed to build a digital product and service version of that. So the next thing we do as service designers, fueling the service economy, is we look for practical ways of making stuff out of the internet. And the thing we thought we needed to make out of the internet had to be schedulable, it had to push information in a timely manner, it had to take information coming in from patients, and it had to network physical devices with data. What we needed was to build a care bot. So using services like Slack and the bots that are available, we built a very first prototype of a care bot. Uh, what the care bot does is um, it tells a patient when it's time to take a blood pressure reading. Um, and we, we've been trialing this with hypertension patients. And, uh, and as service designers, we use very simple prototyping tools like Slack here because that's already got a bot framework. And we use this device, which is a Withings blood pressure monitor. We wanted to use the Nokia super amazing Thing that they built, but it wasn't ready in time. So we built, we found these Withings blood pressure monitors that pump data into the cloud, and we connected it to our bot service. Uh, as a side point, Nokia bought Withings as a result of this project recently. Um, and so, what happens here is the doctor, the clinician, can set uh, a schedule for the patients to take their readings, give them a Withings device, install the app on their phone. Uh, and we trialed that using a Slack bot, and that worked very well. But then the next phase is in our iterative process is to build our own bespoke app. So now we've built a fully working uh, care plan building management deployment tool and a partner app that works with all Withings devices that uh, patients can set. So the next thing that we do as service designers, fueling the service economy, is to build working services and working tools. Sorry, I'm trying to use my iPhone to control. Have you used an iPhone to control a keynote presentation? It's the, one of the weirdest experiences ever. Um, and then uh, building that, we trialed it with five people over three months. This is my favorite. Uh, quote from any user ever. I'm a notification kind of guy. So we, we worked with five hypertension patients. 
sent, we developed our, their own unique care plan, delivered it through the app, and got the data back from them with their scales, their blood pressure monitors, and heart rate meters. And we 88% of all readings were taken according to plan. But the most important the most important bit of insight we got from this very, very small trial was that four of the five participants, the trial ended three months ago. There are four people who are still following it. They're still taking their measurements and sending it. We were told that we were very unlikely to get any behavioral change from this small trial, but we've changed their behavior. Um, and now we are working with Nokia and Withings and the NHS to run a trial for 1,000 patients. So the other thing service designers can do is start to work quickly at scale. Uh, and then I'm just going to quickly talk about two things that are, that are happening to us in the future. The first is this idea of headless services in the service economy. So the future is APIs and as, uh, as, tech, as a technology core and as end users and as designers, we're not going to care about the interface that we consume our services through. So while everyone is trying to build their front end and their front end experience, that in the next 10 years, that's going to be irrelevant. So the future of services and service economy are headless. And then the other th part of the future is that uh, I took this photo in the studio a few weeks ago. These are two members of my team, and they were having a meeting. And I caught this slide. How can they replace me, I'm their manager, with a robot, uh, they're, they're working out how they can ask the business for a day off without me ever knowing that it's been asked. And they're built, so they're building their own, can I take tomorrow off bot? And that's the other future for us as service designers. The service economy is to start to work with automation, AI, and data. Thank, that's, that's it. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for the host for inviting me. Um, this is not precisely right, because I no longer work for this company. <laughs> uh, so if I get sued for misrepresentation, I'm innocent. <laughs> OK. Um, I don't have presentation. I'm autistic, so I can't really make up speeches on the fly, so excuse me with paper. OK. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude for what this college has done for me. Before I came to study my degree in Imperial College, I was a waiter in a Chinese restaurant. After I graduated with a computer science degree from Imperial, I started a software company, Troyport, with only 100 pounds, and sold it for over 100 million US dollars 15 years later. I would never be able to do that without the knowledge and training that this college has given me. I'm deeply grateful. I was told that I, by my host that I only have five minutes to talk about some of my experience in running company. And um, so I'm going to be brief. I'm going to tell you just a few short stories. When running a business, something goes wrong somewhere, not just Sorry, when running a business, something goes wrong somewhere. Someone changes this. Sorry, I mean, when someone running a company, something goes wrong all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it goes wrong all the time. Okay, it's like this, right? This just doesn't come out correctly. Right, one day I got really frustrated with a couple of a few staffs, and I'm going to see my old friend who has happened to be my mentor as well. And he said to me, he, I, I start complaining, and he just stares at me. And he goes, you started this company, you invented this software, you created these jobs positions, and uh, you hire these people, you manage them, you pay them, and you keep them. Now you're telling me it is all their fault for what is going wrong. So I was speechless. So since that day, I started to take full responsibility of anything that happened in the company. Making excuses does not solve any problem. 
confronting the problem does. Stop making excuses and facing up to problems is the best lesson that I have ever learned in my entire life. So in 2006, we bought some marketing gifts and stress ball to give away. And we have, have to come up with some tagline to sort of print on them. So I asked a few customers for some ideas. I said, how would you decide our, how do you, how do you describe our products and services and, and our company? Well, they didn't really give me a direct answer. I mean, they just looked at me like, I don't know. It just works. So it works end up as a tagline on our marketing gift. <laughs> but what it also means is this. A successful business is not about, is all about having working products. If our products don't work, we no longer have a business. It could be luck and chance that lead you to a specific industry. It could be luck that provides you with the business capital. It could be luck that brings you the customers. But however, luck does not bring you a working product. You have to create that yourself. Make sure your product works. Otherwise, you won't have, to, you won't have a business for long. At the end of the day, the most important job for an executive is to make decisions. Deciding what to do or what not to do in the company is very hard if you have no clear guidelines or principles. One day, I pick up a book about, product de about the product development process of Toyota. The words on that book hit me like a brick. It laid down three simple rules. So the rule number one, never produce what your customer do not want. Rule number two, only produce what your customer want. Number three, produce what your customer want as efficient as possible. I mean, it's not as simple as you think, you think about it. <laughs> All right, years goes by, I have internalized this, I would say improved it, these three rules further, and they helped me to make all sorts of decisions in the company. So the following are my three rules. Rule number one, never do what your customer won't pay for. <laughs> number two, only do what your customer will pay for. And number three, do what your customer will pay for as cost effective as possible. Now, it's not simple, I tell you. These rules do not just cover how I decide on what features or design to go in or out of a product. It is the fundamental principle of how I make decisions in the company. It includes the people that I hire, the products that I produce, the furniture that I buy, and the brochures that I print. Warren Buffett said, don't just satisfy your customers, delight them. Delight them we should and we should align everything in our entire company from the products to the people, from the process to the policy to delight them. Only the delighted customers will stay with your business for the long term. That's all. Thank you very much for your time and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Maybe we can move all the chairs so that I don't have a chair for myself. So that we can start. There's no chair for me, but that's okay. Um, so just, as a, just while the panel is setting up, we, uh, we like to make things as interactive as possible, so we're using this platform called Menti. Um, if you'd all take your spot right now, um, maybe you can vote immediately, but um, throughout the panel discussion, if you start to form an opinion, We'd love your, your perspective on the question. Right, uh, there's four questions, but the one we want your perspective on the most is at the end, and it's asking which industry, which industry vertical or sector is the most ripe for disruption through service design. So everything you've heard to, tonight, um, where do you see it's, it's, it's sort of most susceptible or most <coughs> open to right now to, to, to disruption by a service design? So we'd really love to hear your thoughts, and we'll share it towards the end. But um, for now, over to, back to the panel. So we are now ready to take questions. Yes. Uh, for anyone who wants to answer it, 
what does disruption mean for you? So what does disruption mean for you? <laughs> well, <laughs> I can have a stab at it. Maybe there'll be a build on it. Just disruption is just, it's a bit beyond change. It, it really means that there is a core shaking going on. Some big shift is happening in some context, whichever way you want. So if there's a disruption in the market, then the way that the market is operating is going to change considerably or is being shook by something. I don't know if you, yeah. how you guys want to build on that. I think it's a shift of behavior of a group of people, the way they fundamentally do something and then they do it differently. I think it's more about how communities, societies, or groups change. And for me, that would be disruption, whether that's enabled by services or products or events. I think for me, that, uh, that's how I de describe it. I'll, I'll build on it one step further. <laughs> um, agree with the behavioral change angle, at least. I, I think the, uh, the additional um, perspective that's useful to keep in mind is, is to what extent is, what is that behavioral change actually accomplishing? Um, I know in the work that I do, it's really about how do you think about social impact, right? And there are many examples of large-scale behavioral change that are interesting from a behavioral change perspective, but haven't necessarily translated in an improvement in people's lives or their health or their families or, or, or whatever else. And so connecting that behavioral change to some impact story, I think, is what constitutes disruption. And I guess what I, what I found very interesting about what you said, Ravi, was that definitely disruption depends on the context. Yeah. And it's also important to think of the repercussions that the disruption, once it's implemented, will have on the ecosystem. So I guess it's also uh, being able to forward thinking about what's going to happen uh, you know, exactly. uh, after the dis disruption is implemented. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts, Chris? I know that. No? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, well, first of all, I think it's a word that's used far too liberally. I agree. And, <coughs> and I think if you think about like this space now, what would a disruption in the space look like? Yeah. It would be quite shocking and uncomfortable, and it would probably have some kind of repercussions that we weren't expecting. So that, for me, disruption is some, yeah, it's some, disruption is shocking and uncomfortable with repercussions we can't we don't expect and it's used too liberally. And also I have a question because often um, we think that disruption is an app. Is it not? <laughs> it's not. <laughs> I'm sorry Chris to break it to you like that. But, you know, you talked about internet, but internet as a is like a means to an end. So the, the disruption is really having an idea that actually changes behavior and then technology is. So for all my students here, <laughs> Disruption is not an app. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Um, I come from a very different background to everybody. I run software houses and I write software products. But uh, let's talk about quadcopter. You know, those quadcopter that you fly and then you take photograph. Yeah. Or the digital camera, they come along. That, but if you think about what's before that, it tends to have a really perfect ecosystems. I mean, example would be there are technology company that let, let's talk about the credit card that you put mm -hmm. into it and it goes dialing your bank and actually going through they don't go for internet they have to keep dialing some of these systems existing businesses run in a, a completely sort of like ecosystem it's very difficult to disrupt um, you example will be changing a credit card size it would be means actually the wallet will have to change and the credit card has to change. They run in this ecosystem that's so very difficult for you to change and everybody settle in it. No one wants to change it. Now a disruption comes in is, okay, we now have mobile payment. You beep with your watch or something. Now that changes it. So a lot of time you need to have a new technology to trigger that. But sometimes it, can, it doesn't have to be a technology. Sometimes it's that when people are angry enough, they will do something about it. Mm -hmm. Yep, it may be actually a, a particular subscription model that you have that actually keep on ruining your life by forcing you to subscribe for six months. Then you, you, you protest with whatever it is. Uh, a Japanese mobile company is quite interesting. They wouldn't accept any mobile phone like iPhone, etc. And then eventually <coughs> one company give in and um, the whole entire domino collapse. <coughs> so I see that that's kind of disruptions. Yep. Yep. Yes, there's a question. 
Yes. Um, for fear of taking the discussion from the esoteric to the prosaic, I'd like to ask each of you how you would use service design to improve the dreaded call center. <laughs> Something we have to deal with every day of our yeah. lives, which has, to my mind, a, a, a nagging and desperate problem. Who wants to take that? Uh, are you talking about running a call center or actually having to deal with someone else's call I'm talking center? talking about improving the delivery of the service in the same way that the last, the last 12 months we was talking about improving the experience. I guess one way of looking at it is will there be call centers in the near future that would need improving? Because I guess to your point, Chris, there might be no need for people to answer queries and then your whole experience changes. It's a different model. Um, I guess that's a more sort of future-focused or near-future-focused view of call centers. But there is, I, I don't think there's ever going to be an absolute perfect service. It's going to keep changing and evolving because we have people in it that will change and evolve. So there is a lot of work that organizations do using service designers to try and improve their call center experience. I, I did um, work for very briefly, but I did work for a, a gambling company where people would call in swearing at the staff. Mm -hmm. That's a bad experience for the staff, so how can they deliver a good experience? And it was a really interesting situation to mm -hmm. witness. Um, so I think, I think you would use service design to understand the problem in the context. So an organization that's based on fundamentally gambling is going to have a very different, it's going to have less sympathy for their customers versus if you have a telco, which I've also sat in their call centers for many, many months, listening in on calls has a very different experience. But I don't think there's an absolute way of solving that problem or any service because it's so dynamic. Uh, but I do, I do believe that with the use of technology and with a more educated view of how people behave and how we need to engage in a different way and having a really good process of implementing that consistently, monitoring that, and ha being able to iterate quickly on it is a good way of managing that situation. Should we go on order? Or, no, yeah, no, 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 please, you're going to say something. I was going to say, just, yeah, call centers tend to be there when everything else has gone wrong. So the first thing we do is try and eliminate the need for them. What is it? What, when could things have improved in the experience so that the call center wasn't needed? And then, uh, and then thinking about the future more, call centers have existed when the products and the services that we receive have been distributed centrally and sent out to us as consumers of these things. And when they don't work, we complain. But if we think of ourselves more as contributors and not just consumers, if we're active participants in the delivery of services, then you won't need to call us a call center. You'll t call the person who was delivering that service to you. So Airbnb, sorry to use it as a boring example, but uh, I was in Oslo last week, and whenever I had a problem, I didn't call Airbnb's call center. I called the host who was renting out the apartment. So that's one, you have a one-to-one -one interaction with the, the, with the person who's participating in the service, not just the consumer of the service. Yes. Um, so another thing is also we, we think about Will we need call centers in the future? Hopefully we eliminate the need for stupid reasons to call a call center. But also, even if you have bots, they, they were to need behaviors mm -hmm. that they emanate. So service design can be used to figuring out what that vision is that, we're, you, that we are delivering for, as an experience for a customer. And then how does that translate to a call center experience? We talked about empowerment, I think, at this point with Airbnb. is about to empowering diff different people across the organization to solve actually solve a problem. So some rule of thumb things would be creating the right kind of service behaviors that are translated into call center actions, empowering people to make decisions and solve things so that the only thing they can do is push a button. You can design a great conversation, but it's not going to resolve anything. So it really needs to work with the ecosystem of the whole organization. But with a simple answer, I would say, figure out what, did, what experience needs to be delivered and translate that into service behaviors that are happening in the cause, contact center or any other channel, be it a bot or a website. Uh, well, to uh, a little bit, if I'm running a call center, I think it's very important to understand the objective for me to run the call center. Now, given the example of the casino, if the call center is to form an addicted gambler 
to actually complain they lost money, I might actually say, you know what, I need this line because I need these people to keep them happy and come back. I will put a very lovely voice on it, make sure, oh, I'm unfortunate, I hear you actually lost some money. You know? I mean, if let's actually say the objective of this particular uh, 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 sort of like a, a call center is to sort out some of your problem, then you really have to go back to the bottom, uh, I mean, the really core, root, root cause is that, why is these people calling you? <coughs> call center are very expensive, human are very expensive. Uh, when I was running my software house, my support side of it never made any money. Even we charge a fortune per hour, we still couldn't make money. And it has more conflict when, it, when the invoice go out. They, they argue more on that side than anything else. So call center, is a is a, I see that as a necessary evil. And we do what we can to actually eliminate it. Now, uh, if you see that actually all the call center, that which gives you trouble, is that maybe they're giving you homework. Press one now. Press two now, press one again, listen to this Edward, press one. Because they don't want you to complain. Because I actually sold you a product that I want you to hate. I forced you to actually subscribe for 12 months that you cannot cancel. And I, you, if you want to cancel it, sorry, you can't do it on the phone, you must write it in. But actually, you write it in, you didn't use the original signature, right? <laughs> <coughs> because the, their motive of doing it is to stop you doing it. Do they know they are, they are annoying? Yes, of course they do. <laughs> but if you actually complain to them, they send you a form, fill in this blank, actually give me some comments. They give you more homework. So that's my view. You really have to address the, the root cause and the reason why that call center was there, and maybe just to annoy you. <laughs> that's a very interesting <laughs> angle. Yeah. I'm just yeah, being running well, a company. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I could top that. <laughs> but I mean, I, maybe just to, to tie a few of these threads together, I think that the, the service design answer to that would actually be to reframe that problem, right, and say that's not the right question. Is that, is that in fact, what is, I think you were getting at a, at a theme of like, what is the fundamental kind of mm -hmm. reason or, or the under, underlying need for why people are calling a call center? And as you, part of what a design process will do is try to unpack that reason into, a, into some, some very concrete kind of patterns, right? And it may be there are actually some very different, to, to continue with this example, there's the, the, the drunk gambler who's calling, there's a the gambler who lost his money, there's a the gambler who's, you know, whatever, tried to do something online and now is calling as a, as a last resort. But there's a set of different, you know, personas or behavioral profiles that all suggest a different use of the call center. And for some of those, an op, like, like I think what you're hinting at in your voice is that for some of those, a more optimized, friendly, better, streamlined call center experience is in fact the answer. But for others, that may not be the case, right? And for others, in fact, it's less about designing the call center, but investing your resources in designing a better website or a better email channel or training the agents or training the, uh, you know, the salespeople or, or whatever else, right? And so I think the, the, the human-centered lens of design would try to turn that problem into a broader set of, uh, into, a broader, into a broader understanding of, of who you're trying to serve, and then a broader set of solutions and channels that are not just the call center, but in, encompass the whole set of capabilities, capabilities and assets of the organization. Yeah, just um, going back to disruption. Um, within industries or certain industries, I find it hard to not think about the incumbents who might have a vested interest in keeping the things the way they are. So just what's your viewpoints on, do you work with them? Do you work against them? I'm sure many of you work with them, so you could share some of your insights. Thanks. Shall I answer that? Edmund, yes. I, I'm, I'm just, all my experience is all running company. I work with them if it benefits my business. I will actually go against them if I find a hole that I can actually pluck. Now the thing is, you've got to be careful with one thing which someone told me. Just because you see someone left a big business hole, and you think you can fill it. An example would be, uh, certain airline is flying a particular route, and they charge a fortune for that route. So you come up that, I'm going to disrupt it. I'm going to have this low-cost airline. I'm going to rent this plane. I'm going to run this low-cost airline for this lake, and I'm going to cut them into half the price. Just before you launch, the airline is going to say, we're going to drop the price by 70% tomorrow. And they're going to pick this thing up that actually right in front of your nose before you reach it. So it's sometimes very dangerous that if you're going to do that. But the thing is, at the end of the day, if you're running a business yourself, you do what you think is beneficial. If it disrupts them, you do it. If you don't, you don't. I mean, if you think of a new phone, 
to sell to Apple, they buy it, then you don't disrupt them. If they actually don't want it, then you're going to disrupt them. <laughs> well, that would be my <laughs> practical view. Yeah. I think they're always going to exist. It's just how it happens in any kind of context. It's a human behavior to want to cling to something that you have and stop other people from getting it or keeping your interests safe. So it, you always learn ways to work with them, work around them, push them away, or just keep on going with status quo. You just need to learn, depending on the specific case, you just figure out a new way. Design can be as good as the people you work with, right? If the organization is not receptive, the, the project that you spoke about, the Dubai airport, is really receptive to the way they want to work, they're willing to change, then they will make that change. If there are organizations who don't want certain things to happen, and that you can't, they, they'll be as good as what they bring to the table. Because we, when you design services, you cannot design that in isolation. You depend on a, a large group of people, teams, with a variety of skill sets. So they all have to be brought in and have a similar mindset and end goal. Otherwise, you will fail. Thank you. We have a question here. Hi. Um, sorry, can I can oh, sorry. I'd like to answer that Please. question? But because I've had a really emotional response to it, I feel deeply depressed by your question. Not your question, but what your question has done for me. Because uh, <laughs> I've always had faith that the incumbents <coughs> want to change. Like, I've always believed that deep down, they want to disrupt themselves, they want to be their own future. But I was just reflecting, thinking, I've got to give you an example of where I've worked with one and we've been able to turn them around. And after 20 years, I can't think of an example of where, <laughs> we've, actually, where we've done it. I've tried every way I can imagine of, disrupt, of disrupting within a, an incumbent, whether it's in media, telecoms, banking. And hand on heart, we've made, we've made some great interventions, we've made some changes, some alterations, some improvements, but I don't think we've disrupted anyone. It, in all of them, I can think of ex very tangible examples where we've shown them the disruption, and we've taken them to see it, and we've prototyped it, and we've developed it, and they've had it, but for one reason or another, they've turned it away because it didn't, it didn't sit within their current business logic. So, yeah, tragically, and now I feel like going back to my studio and just shutting the doors on it because <laughs> I build my business on, on the belief that we can work with incumbents to disrupt them, but I can't give you an, an example of us actually having done it. Oh, well. Thanks. I, I, know, I know I spoke already, but uh, I, I, you, you dragged me into an example. <laughs> but this is actually quite relevant uh, to the whole topic. I actually wrote software for electronics trading. And that means allowing traders to actually put in prices for their offers or the bids uh, onto, through their computer screen. And it will be transacted on a, on a server, central server. And at the time I was doing that, was actually start launching in real life trading, was 1999. The whole entire industry was conquered by the voice brokers. Basically, if you want the price of a, a barrel of uh, uh, one million barrels of crude oil, you call up the broker and say, "What's the best bid on this month of uh, September crude oil?" So the guy will give you a bid. Now, by actually putting that electronically, I basically actually take a lot of voice brokers out of their work. Now, s big brokers won't use it because they're already making a lot of money. So I sold it to a small broker. They said, well, I'm the bottom of the power. I have nothing to lose. Here you go. Give me your computer. I'm going to give this screen to everybody. They will put the prices in, transact half price on the screen. So before you know it, everybody put the prices onto the screen and trading half price. So what happened is that the big brokers, which comes to me quite a few times already, uh, well, quite, quite, quite often, would take me out for coffee swear at me for two hours non-stop, <laughs> telling me that how stupid I am by earning a few dimes or a few pounds from a software that I enable a tiny little broker to ruin his industry. <laughs> so I said, I don't give a damn because actually I just want to sell software. I'm sorry that actually has negative effect to you. But, uh, but and then he goes, I'm going to buy you out. I said, OK. Uh, but I know after I buy you out, Another idiot is going to write another software. <laughs> so I said, well, if you buy me out, I mean, chances are that my staff will start another one tomorrow because it sells. <coughs> so
So if this tug of war goes on for years, yes, the incumbent one absolutely hate it if they have, if they have an interest and they got something to lose. But if they don't have something to lose and they have nothing to lose, <laughs> they're going to fight for it, um, then they will do it. And for me, I'm just advantage to enabling whatever weapons you want to buy, and I'm, I'm quite happy to build it for you. <laughs> Hi. Um, my question is with regards to tax. So we all have to pay tax. Well, some people don't have to pay tax, the likes of Uber and Airbnb. Um, so, and when tax doesn't go through the system, it doesn't go through HMRC and doesn't funnel to your local council, then you are losing a lot of that money that should be paying for your local services. So if you were given the chance to take over HMRC office in Wales for a week, then how would you disrupt the tax system? Not so it's easier for me to pay the tax, but so you can claw in the tax that we're losing in the UK. And that's then obviously replicated for the rest of the world, but how would you do, it, do that for the UK? One key thing with that is what does the UK population want? There is a simple solution and it exists already. It's used in Scandinavia, but it would not be applicable in the UK because of the, private, the perceptions of privacy in the UK. So that my, there is no simple answer to that. The question is there's always solutions. The question is what is adaptable and what works in the local context of what, what's being applied. So. Um, I would have an answer to that, to your question, but whatever I would, re would recommend would not make sense in this context, I think. But it's, you, you can always apply a service design thinking approach and, and study really what's going on, what are the different stakeholders that, that, that are involved, what are the processes that need to be, that, that, that need to make things happen, what are the enablers, so many things. A week would definitely not be enough time to, to do that, but. I mean but yeah. Just, just hypothetically. But, yeah, exactly. But, it's, but just, it's, it's just to solve the problem that yeah. a lot of the services that are now being taken over by Uber and Airbnb and Amazon is enabled for them because they actually get so many tax breaks. Yeah. You see? So if those tax was to stay in the system and it was to stay in the public sector, then maybe the better question is not how you redesign the tax system, how would you redesign public services? Mm. Yeah, definitely. The question is always being redesigned. Great. I love how you <laughs> answered your own question. <laughs> you know, so, so just to ask the question in a different way is how do we pay for public services? If tax is broken, if that doesn't work. But to, to answer your question directly, I wouldn't want me in charge of tax for a week, man. That's not going to work out well. It's so mega fun. It'll be great fun. Perhaps a cynical answer to that. <laughs> Uh, I, I currently work for OOJ, um, and one of the things that HMRC is doing at the moment is actually trying to get more tax. Um, however, they're, do they're not doing that for big companies, they're actually doing it for uh, small companies. Uh, and a lot of them being kind of online companies, whether they're cute, whether they're contracting for uh, the civil service, um, who, you know, people who go into service design, I would probably perhaps have pretty broad assumption say that they don't go in it for the money and the reason why so many people are interested in working in government is precisely to to impact change but actually what HMRC is doing at the moment will arguably impact the exact transformation that you're talking about both in public services um, but also um, it will get potentially more tax um, but again it's it's kind of it's picking on the little guy rather than, than the big guys um, but perhaps that's a very cynical view I guess um, so I'm a design student, and one of the things I'm struggling with is that um, some of the strengths of services I'm thinking of being able to reframe the question, look at the leverage points in the system, often for me particularly have a flip side which is almost paralysis of choice of information and in trying to create a hierarchy of where you think the most important thing is, you can often, well I'm finding that I'm not necessarily being able to get stuck in, in sort of the rapid dirty prototyping that maybe is sort of more befitting of a sort of product design uh, system, and I'm just wondering if you have any advice for how you kind of can break that funk when you're kind of starting out with like an initial concept and coming up with sort of ways of getting your hands dirty beyond sort of just creating some sort of flash uh, wireframes of stuff and actually thinking, okay, how do I validate this concept for long-term behavior change? 
booked up. We we're spending two years of like resources to even validate that. Any word of advice? I run a <coughs> I run a service design class in Co in a school in Copenhagen, and all my dead postgrad students, and they all suffer the same that same paralysis, that same fear of actually doing something. Because it's really great to do some research and think a lot, but then the act of making is terrifying. But the, the role of making isn't to make, the role of making is to learn from having made. And you learn by putting it in front of people. So you often make the mistake of thinking a prototype is an object. A prototype is the act of putting an object in someone's hands and learning and observing from them and using it. That's the value of a prototype. So what I do in my class, which is four weeks long, is I give them the brief and I get them to do the whole project in a day from beginning to end. So, and by the end of the day, I want you to have done some research, developed some ideas, built a, a sketch, prototyped it by testing it with users, and that tomorrow you've got to come back and show me evidence of having that prototype having been used by some real people. Now, a day, everyone says a day is never long enough to do anything <coughs> meaningful. But you get incredible results just by forcing yourself to put something in someone's hands and put some part of your experience in the hands of a user, and you'll learn so much from doing it. If you just force yourself not to necessarily make something, but to give someone the experience and to learn from that, you'll move yourself on a million miles. And then repeat it. What I do in my classes, I do it in a day, then they have two days, then they have four days, and then they have two weeks. I guess the existential crisis having is. Uh, <laughs> You can create stuff like that, and you can get a positive response through its novelty and through it being new. And that doesn't necessarily, I personally am struggling with the idea of does that validate something where you want to create change over a period of months? You don't know, and I don't yeah. know until you've done it. Just do it. Stop all of these. <laughs> you can think of a thousand reasons not to do it because yeah. it's imperfect. Just do it. Just make it and learn, and then come back to me and tell me whether it was useless or not. And I guarantee I'll find some value in what you did for having done it because you're in a position having known something rather than just predicting something. You've got to push yourself over the fear of building the perfect thing and just have something out there in the world that you can learn from. I think I agree with you, Chris, because <coughs> this is what I was saying earlier. We, we tend to think that you do the thinking and then you do the making. We just have to stop thinking of things in that linear manner because when you're making, you're thinking as well. Yeah. And I think what what's... Uh, What's interesting is, to just expand on what you said, when you put something in the hand of another person, you have, we have to change your mindset of stop looking at how it works and what, what, what people see, what, where is what that behavior is. And to expand on the existential crisis, I always wonder, when you work in digital, that we're not really creating anything that's going to create long-term change. Because by the time you push something out, three months later, it's going to look very different. So you're building things in sand, essentially. So that is, that is how it, it is what it is. And if you, if you think about your kind of long-term value over three months, if you've built something and launched it every day for three months, you've m had much bigger impact than if you'd thought about something for three months because you've impacted those small people that you've prototyped with. So you just doing, making, getting out of that mental hurdle and into the physical world is massively mm. important. But you, you've got to be careful, with actually, whether you're doing this to make money or not. <laughs> Because if you don't need to make money, then you can play with it forever. <laughs> okay? But if you need to make money, you better make sure that you don't do anything that the customer won't pay for and only do what the customer will pay for. Right? And if you're gonna be paid, if they're gonna pay for it, you wanna be as cost effective as possible. Because the lower the cost of the production, the higher your profits. And when it comes to the competition, it's the one who actually built it for the lowest cost gonna survive. The one that's expensive building costs is gonna go bust first. Thank you, Edmund. There's a question over there. You, you all spoke uh, well about uh, the service design, product design, company design. Now, Steve Jobs went a step further to try to perpetuate Apple in the next uh, X years, maybe 100 years, and the ability to reinvent itself as a company in terms of products and services and, and so on. So we, we covered briefly uh, uh, service centers which is a golden opportunity to get feedback from the field, from the customers, both qualitative, uh, in terms of speaking to the people directly, and also collecting management information, defects, uh, MI, whatever it is, and feeding back to, to the management to evolve the service. So my, my question is, uh, from your presentations, I have not seen where you would fit um, building the, the learning capability, the evolving capability, the 
uh, reinventing capability in the service design so the organization can move forward uh, to, the next, to the next phase. So if you can expand on this, please. It's a really good question because um, one of the things that, you're right, we probably haven't spoken about enough is the whole idea of embed and sustain, which is also the biggest challenge. In comparison, it's much easier to, to talk to people, work out what the problems are. And as you do it over time, you get better and better at picking out the insights um, and creating something out of it. I, I work, from my experience, working inside an organization is far better than consulting them from outside as to how they should do service design. 